Okay, you're up. Ian Durham. All right, you ready to go? All right. Uh, um, we began the, the conference with a <coughs> bald person. We're going to end with a bald person. Um, so uh, when Dean and I met, we both had hair. Um, <laughs> Dean had really, really cool hair. I really like, I wish I had Dean's hair. Um, I, I'm just going to take a, a, a quick moment to uh, acknowledge also the, uh, uh, the Darug and uh, Gundugura uh, people on which this land is based. Um, and their word for country is uh, Gura, I believe. So anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about, so I have to apologize. I do believe I am probably the only uh, physicist, like, like, practicing physicist room, because I, I think Daniela has a degree in physics, and of course, and Dean, and, well, Harold. I'm retired. Yeah, you, you're, <laughs> we're, you're more, I sort of think of you as more of like a philosopher. Yeah, you know. once a physicist, ever a physicist. All right, well, anyway. <laughs> um, so, I have to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, because this is the, the, the last talk, I'm gonna try to be rapid, as rapid as is possible, my wife is sitting in the back thinking, oh my god, this is never going to end. Um, and uh, my, my father gets into this, and my mother says, land the plane, Thomas, land the plane. Um, so uh, I'm, I am going to, there's going to be a little teensy bit of math. Uh, when it comes up, I'll try to dance around like Nathan and, you know, make it look more interesting than it is. Um, <laughs> So, um, and I don't, I didn't mean that's a, that's a comment about your talk. I meant that that's a comment about my talk. I think your talk was great. I, like, I want to go read the Zohar now, um, as I told you last night. Uh, so thanks to Dean for pointing out this um, quote from uh, Georg Cantor about uh, infinity, because nothing misses a kind of infinity, if you think about it. Paradoxes about infinity arise from projecting the behavior of the finite onto the infinite. There's, a, there's sort of a compliment to this quote, which Dean used in his talk. Philosophy is an attempt to express the infinity of the universe in terms of the limitations of language. I've long been interested in the limitations of language um, because, uh, as many people are probably aware, but, you know, or maybe you just haven't thought about it until you re really thought about it, there's, if you, every word, in any language, every word is defined, well, I, I shouldn't say in any language. In all the languages I know, maybe there are some languages out there where this is not true, but at least in certainly in most Western languages, every word in the dictionary is defined in terms of other words in the dictionary. It's a completely recursive thing. The dictionary is recursive, which means it, there, there are some truths that you just have to take for granted. Um, in order to understand, say, the dictionary. So let's start with the, very quickly, with the Oxford English Dictionary, third edition definition of nothingness. I'm like, what the heck is nothingness? So obviously the, you know, the obvious one is it's the realm of not existence, that which doesn't exist, or the, the state or condition of being non-existence, or the absence or cessations of consciousness or life. I find that interesting that they put that as C as part of one. Like, I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, I would give that its own entry. But anyway, that's just me. Um, and then, of course, in philosophy specifically, in existential thought, non-existence or the non-existence as an ontological category considered in relation to human existence. I'm not sure that's entirely true either, because certainly in some philosophy, philosophy of physics, um, there's a discussion of ontological existence um, related to things that are not human. Um, this is a big debate in quantum mechanics, which is um, sort of my day job, is, is I do uh, quantum, me quantum mechanics. I'm going to skip two and three. Um, nothingness also comes up as a count noun, which is a non-existent thing, a void, a state of non-existence or worthlessness, a worthless, insignificant, or unimportant thing or action. And then I found it interesting that the OED added this fifth one, 
from Buddhism in the form of no thingness, which some people have talked about, uh, which is equivalent to the sunyata. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few of these. One curious thing is that in the definition in the OED, I, I, under the fifth one, they, under each of these, they give examples. So they use it in a sentence. You know, and so I just thought this one was really cool because here we are. If you sit for long enough in the West, we're not in West Australia, but if you sit for long enough in the West Australian landscape, you're extremely likely to be aware of no thingness and to fall off the rational spectrum and float in something very much larger than the self. Now, I've never been to the West Australian landscape, although we are headed to Mungo tomorrow, so which is not quite West Australia, but anyway. I, I, I don't think you should take the weekend to Australia as a good definition. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> is, that, is that a like a, a rag? It's, 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 it's a Murdoch press. Huh? Oh, God. Did I just quote a Murdoch yeah, no, publication? No, 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 no. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> Please forgive me. It's a beautiful sentence, though. Anyway, so a lot of those definitions of nothingness seem to, to have rely on this concept of existence. Um, so, so let's first maybe just try to understand existence. And existence, I, I, putting that aside for a second, the verb to be is is the most fundamental verb in in. Most languages that I know, uh, and I don't know many, but I, 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 I've tried learning a couple of different languages, and um, right, you know, the very first thing they, they teach you when you learn these languages, and I've, the two I'm working on right now are Japanese and German. And of course, German is very close to English. <coughs> Japanese is very different, and Japanese, but it's what's the very first they, they teach you concept it is to be, like that's the very first thing that they teach you. So it's very fundamental. So what does it mean for something to actually exist? What does that even mean? And I, I have to do this. I say it would not be a conference with Dean and I present if there was not a picture of this guy. Dean and I have long worked on, well, I, you probably don't do anything on Eddington anymore, but um, uh, Eddington is a, famous for a lot of things. Everybody knows him for his astronomy stuff, but he was actually really a deep thinker. He wrote a great book called Philosophy of Physical Science. Had some quirky ideas that um, I studied for my PhD thesis. But um, he, he writes in his Philosophy of Physical Science, existence seems to be a rather important property because I gather that one of the main sources of division between different schools of philosophy is the question whether certain things exist or not. But I cannot even begin to understand these issues because I can find no explanation of the term exist. Um, so he's somewhat crit critical of, remember, he's not a philosopher. He is a, an astronomer, physicist, mathematician type of person. Um, um, and so I, I take this a little bit as a criticism of philosophy in his time. But um, anyway, for example, this is an example he gives. Does an overdraft on a bank account exist? Well, as far as the bank is concerned, you better believe it exists. <laughs> they will close your account and they will come after you if you, overdra you if you have an overdraft on your account. As far as they're concerned, it exists. But it's a negation. It's a fundamental negation. If you've taken more money out than you have, it's an overdraft. So, and it's not the, it's, it's not, He's not talking about the money, the extra money that's been taken out. He's talking about the concept of the overdraft itself. Does the overdraft itself exist? And again, you could go to court and say, hey, that's not, a, there's nothing physical about an overdraft. And they're going to say, sorry, you got to pay up, whatever. So it's an interesting question. What does it mean to exist? So Eddington sort of has this answer about it that um, builds into this, this larger philosophy of his called structuralism. Um, and he takes X exists as being an incomplete sentence. So whatever X is, he says X exists is an incomplete sentence. He says what we really ought to do is take the word exists as being synonymous with the word is. 
And nobody, nobody really says, although I actually have heard people say this, but nobody says, you know, uh, the computer is. <coughs> Usually you say the computer is, is what, right? Obviously, I have heard people say, you know, simply, I am, right? So nevertheless, Eddington was su uh, suggesting that, that, that those kinds of statements don't make sense. So he says, x exists really should be x is dot, 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 something, OK? So you, you, can, you can take this however you want. I, I want to also make a point that I am I'm not, I, I'm semi-agnostic about some of what I'm going to talk about today in the sense that I'm putting it forward as a, as a suggestion. This is not a rigorous mathematical argument. There's no rigorous logic applied here. It's a work in progress. It's some ideas that I've been batting around. So I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to sort of go too far out on a limb and, and, and then get accused of, you know, totally screwing things up. But anyway, this, this implies a duality, though. Okay? If x is something, then it's not something else. Right? So if x is something, well, then it's not something else. And so mathematically, uh, this idea is captured by this mathematical property uh, called uh, idempotence. Um, and Eddington uses this idempotence as uh, sort of a, a piece of his, his structuralism, of how he, he goes about creating this, this theory. Um, so I'm going to make a slight mathematical diversion Again, I apologize for anyone who is not mathematically inclined. Um, so a standard function, mathematical function, I try to make this as easy as, as possible to understand. The way you can think about it is it's a box. And you have something, some number, an x, or it doesn't even have to be a number. It can be something. Something, and you put it into the box, grinds, you know, turn a crank or something, and something else comes out. That's a function. I, the, the, the picture I often use sometimes with my students, especially when I'm talking about quantum mechanics, is that I actually turn the box this way, and I, I, I call it my quantum meat grinder, right? You know, an old-fashioned meat grinder. You take meat, you put it in, grind it, something else comes out, right? So that's kind of what a, a function is for those of you who are not maybe mathematically inclined. You can think of it as a a way if you take something, you stick it in, something happens, and then something else comes out. Okay? So an, an idempotent function is you take the function and you stick it into itself and you get the function back out again. <laughs> so here's a, and it, there you can think there's, oh God, there's like an infinite re e regress here, right? But Here's the function. So this, here's this, and I plug it into itself, and I get itself back out again. Okay. That's an idempotent function. All right. So an example, a simple example, and the most fundamental one that that Eddington. Well, I don't know if it's the most fundamental idempotent equation, but the, this is the one Eddington uses. X squared equals x. Also, if you're a mathematically inclined person, that's the same thing as x squared minus x equals zero. But x squared equals x. This is a valid equation. Um, and the interesting thing about this equation is, is that it has, I mean, it has many, many solutions. For example, um, if, uh, well, yeah, anyway. At its core, there are really only two solutions, two fundamental solutions, one and zero, OK? So 1 is a valid solution because 1 squared is 1. And 0 is a valid solution because 0 squared is 0. There are other solutions you can build on that in, in more complicated ways, but that's way beyond what we're going to talk about here. So anyway, so the only solutions to this equation that you care about are 1 and 0. OK. Either x exists or it doesn't. 
something, something else. So ex existence and non-existence are intrinsically linked in this concept, right? They are, they both are solutions to this item potent equation. They are, they're, they're sort of the basis of everything here. Interestingly, so existence, this is a, this is a quote of Eddington's. I should have put quotes around it. Existence is the only structure possessed by a single element, right? So if you take a, a, the most fundamental thing, what Eddington is saying is that the most fundamental thing is something that either exists or doesn't exist. That's the most fundamental thing from which you can build up everything else. You know, yes, you can, you know, because he, you know, he knew about electrons and, and subatomic particles, particles and things. He had a whole theory of quantum physics. And you know those particles have properties, spin and charge. He knew all about that. But what he's saying is that it, at even below that level, the most fundamental thing is something that either exists or does not exist. That's that's the starting point. And here's a quote from this. I'm going to use this quote a couple times from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, and the entry on nothingness, even a solipsist agrees there is at least one thing. I'm going to come back to that. So um, these these solutions actually, if you uh, this is a slight di diversion, uh, another slight diversion. So it's a diversion from the diversion. These solutions actually give the first two of uh, Piano's uh, first his three primitives. So uh, Piano, um, a lot of number theory sort of starts from some of Piano's axioms and then you get ZFC um, uh, set theory and stuff. But he has these sort of three primitives that exist. Zero, number, and successor. The one reason I want to put this up, there well, are a couple of reasons, but one of the main reasons I want to put this up there is that there are, there are languages in the world where um, you have some languages that they only possess words in their vocabulary for these three things. There are some languages that don't even possess a word for successor. They have a, a, a word for zero and they have a word for one. Or in one, there's one uh, indigenous group in South America that has, uh, I think, I don't, they may not have a word for zero and they have a word for one and they have a word for many. And that's it. They don't have a word for four, they don't have a word for 10, nothing like that. So in some sense, there's some very deep uh, fundamental truths about these concepts, zero, number, successor. Now, uh, Piano, or if you want to re really read Bertrand Russell, took this as implying an, an order, nothing leads to something, leads to something else. We're going to stray a little bit from that, but what, one of the interesting questions is: is what is the nature of those those links? If you're going from nothing to something to something else, can you go the other way? What what's the nature of that? How how does all this stuff come about? Okay. One last thing, because this and this is really important, um, as Eddington notes, and this is about the most mathematical I'm going to get. So we're going to define a relation between two idempotent things. So I got two idempotent things. They either exist or they don't exist. And I have a relation. <laughs> Harold's laughing. That was a misspelling. This is why I'm laughing. Oh, I'm missing an M. No, no, it's it have a pen too much. What? <laughs> idempotent. Oh God. At least it's not impotent. <laughs> it's, not, it's the last. It, it's the last talk. <laughs> hey, at least you're engaged. <laughs> you're reading my slides. I put that in just just to check it. So uh, anyway, to find a relation between idempotent things, not item. Yeah. Anyway, um, 
As this, this, you can take this just to be um, a multiplication, okay? So I put a dot because, you know, normally we do multiplication as an x, and I already put x's in there. I'm like, oh, crap, I can't use an x. So it, in math and physics, we use a dot sometimes, okay? Um, so there's something. There's something else. And uh, mathematically, basically, a relation to multiplication. So if x1 is 1 or 0 and x2 is 1 or 0, the relation is only 1 if both of the x's are 1, right? 1 times 1 is 1. But if either of them is 0, the relation is 0. The relation doesn't exist. So what this is saying is that, and this is really important, the relation doesn't exist if one or both of those things doesn't exist, right? So one or both of those things, both of those things has to exist for the relation to, to exist. I would also suggest that, well, yeah, you'll see what I'm going to talk about in a second. So in English, if the relation, should, the relation exists if and only if the two things exist, okay? What's that E thing? Hmm? Belongs to oh, don't worry about that. That's just math. Yeah, it, it, it's a set theoretic thing. It just says x1 is, the, the value of x1 is in the set that includes 0 and 1. So it's a member of the set. But don't worry about that. Okay. So a universe of no things, so no thing nests. All right, so let's so, say I've got a universe that's got three things in it and three relations. And um, I can inter interpret this as a universe of no thingness. Why? Because it's not, there's not one thing, there are three things. It's a, it's a wholeness, right? No thingness, I take here as being. There's no thing, there's everything, okay? No thingness, okay? So, <coughs> no thingness would suggest that there's no independent reality for the individual pieces. No thingness, right? So if I take thing to mean an X, right? I'm going to get to this in a point, at a point, but basically the punchline is, is that the, the individual things don't make sense out of context with the others. I'll, I'll come back to that. Nothingness is all zeros. So no thingness I take as the existence of everything, okay? There are no intrinsic properties. No intrinsic properties. All property. extrinsic relational. Correct. They're all, uh, all extrinsic, all relational. I, and I, I believe this to my core. That, and of course, to my, when I say I believe something to my core, you know, an hour later, if you really give me a good argument, I could change my mind. But um, at least as of now, I believe to my core that relational, like, all properties are relational. This, and actually, I real, when I say I believe this to my core, but I can change my mind, I haven't changed my mind in 20 years. This is something that I studied for my PhD. And I mean, this is a fundamental aspect of Eddington's structuralism, is this idea of uh, relational, everything is sort of relational. He's like one of the original relationalists, I think. Uh, in uh, Eddington, he's really Saussure, and that's where he's getting it. No. Mm -hmm. Russell, more Russell. Yeah, Russell. He's very much a Russ uh, and Russ and Russell is. I love Russell too. So. Um, so would you prefer then the existence of all or everyness or something? Because it feels like now your existence of everything just again says what you just yeah, escaped. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think the word again limitations of language. The word everything. Yeah. The word everything implies individual things, exactly. which of course. That's the point is, is that there are no individual things, right? So it would be all, maybe existence of all, or you know, even that implies it. I'm sure there's a 
I'm sure there's a, a there's probably a word in German or Japanese that, that mm. would do. English is terrible for that. Can I just say that in some, in Tokyo, in some language, the judgment is discounted. I'll give you an example. In the, in the laboratory as well, there is no word, no no numbers. Hmm. There are no numbers. And you talk about that totality. The way they would count people was the loss from the total. Oh, interesting. So That's so fascinating. So it's a negation. So if I was counting the people in this room, instead of going one, two, three, four, five, seven, I would look at the total of people in the room and say the boy with the red hair freckles is not there in that spot. Interesting. So there's a missing uh, part of the yeah, whole. Yeah, yeah, so it's a missing part of the, the whole. part of the whole is, is how they would count the, the total. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, so... So yeah, so maybe I should say existence of wholeness or existence of one. Um, well, that's similar to my uh, thinking of the all. Okay. Yeah, I think it's similar to a lot of the ideas that people have talked about. Um, so nothingness then would be the non-existence of everything. Okay, so in this sense, I'm suggesting that, that this structuralist idea suggests this idea of um, that the universe itself is, is idempotent. I want to take one other quick mathematical, actually maybe I won't do this because we're running out of time, but it, you can actually start poking around with uh, Russell's paradox if you want when you, when you do this, you start dealing with sets. Uh, that's way too much for now. So we'll, we'll, we'll go to dinner. And anyone who's mathematically inclined, we can talk about Russell's paradox. So a universe of no things and of nothing. Let's start with something which may exist or may not exist. You could then proceed to something else, which then you would, would suggest that they, I, I would suggest that they make no sense uh, individually. There has to be some kind of relation between them. In fact, I... Personally, and I've long, long thought about this, that I don't think a universe of just this makes any sense at all. I think, because uh, I really am a relational person, I think that you have to have at least two things for the concept of a thing to make sense, okay? Um, and they are sort of parts of a whole. Um, in fact, you can. There's a whole argument you can go through that that if you want to get if you want to recover space, not time. Well, actually, even time. There's a whole argument you can go through that you need at least three things to recover space. But anyway, that's beside the point. Some questions that this brings up, though: Do things exist independently of one another? Are the relations causal? <coughs> can something arise from nothing? Because remember, going back to the the. Russell and Piano, there's this nothing, something, something else, and there's this idea that there's an actual order there. And the, the bigger question is, at what point do we have a system that's philosophically meaningful? So what I want to do is I want to take a slight diversion. So I, a couple of years ago, got involved with uh, working with some Tibetan Buddhist monks in India, and uh, I despite the fact that my cousin is a, uh, has been a practicing Buddhist for 40 years and lived in, in, in Dharamshala, India for a year and, and in Tibet, I never really paid much attention to, to, to Buddhism. Um, and uh, so, but then I, I got involved with these monks and, and, I, and I just started, they gave me some reading material and I got really into this and I, I discovered, wow, there's, and actually that was kind of the point. They wanted, you know, I was there to teach them stuff, but they were really there to teach me stuff too. And so I, I, I picked up some ideas, and I don't want to, I, I, don't, I don't want to suggest that, you know, I know that people think that I'm taking, you know, I might get accused of taking some things out of context and culturally appropriating things or whatever, but I've had discussions with the, the monks about these things, and one of the things that we, we discussed in our, in our work was, yeah, there are, some of these ideas really are useful in, in, these, in these sort of scientific, pseudo-scientific Western philosophical ideas. So all of the questions I just mentioned are really interrelated. And what the sort of the Tibetan Buddhist perspective on this is, is that they, they had, at least in uh, 
a particular, because there are lots of many, there, there are lots of different Buddhist schools, right? And so I'm very specifically looking at the Tibetan Buddhist tradition at, and specifically the one that is practiced by uh, the, the Dalai Lama because the program I was involved in was, is, was run by the Dalai Lama. So I just want to put that out there. So they, they have this idea of dependent origination, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And they also have this idea of causal closure, okay? And causal closure, by the way, for anyone who does consciousness research, is a, a, a which I, I do do now, um, is, a, is a big topic in, um, in, at least in mathematical models of consciousness these days. Is, is the universe causally closed, and can you have a causally closed theory? And what's interesting about these things is, is why do I have this word relations in between them? The whole idea of dependent origination is, is this. Independent existence is completely meaningless. All things arise dependently, simultaneously. Now, in order for them to do that, there has to be, they, the whole idea is that they have relations. So they, they Everything arises at this, or everything, everything fundamental, right? Because so, I, and again, I'm not a, someone who's a Buddhist practitioner could would know better than I. I'm not entirely sure how they explain you. Know, like, how do you get a a plant that maybe wasn't there ten years ago? But the the idea is that at least at its fundamental level, you have some basic things that have to arise arise. Dependently, they have dependent origination. You cannot have an in independent existence is a meaningless concept. All things have to arise dependently. That's what I was talking about with my take on Eddington structuralism. So um, they also have a very deep fundamental need for um, a, cause, cause, uh, a causal structure in Tibetan Buddhism, um, at least in this tradition that I'm aware of. And it's those relations that also sort of are the conduit for that, uh, the, for the causality aspect, okay? So, you'll, and you'll see in a, in a, in a minute here what I, what I mean by that. Um, in order for something to exist, it's gotta possess causal power. Something has to have causal power for it to exist. So the universe is causally closed, and the relations are the glue that ties everything together, right? So the, in order for something to exist, it's got to have causal power, which means it has to have a relation with something else, and it had to de, the, there's this dependent origination. They all had to arise together, okay? So to possess causal power, though, means it has to have this power over something else. And I don't mean, you know, over, of course, implies, again, a, immediately you think over, okay, there's this sort of, you know, directionality to it, which I, I don't necessarily want to suggest that because I, I don't think my reading of, of the Buddhist writings on this suggests that it's not, it's, it's, a, it's more of this code-dependent causality, right? It's a, it's a mutual kind of causality that's going on here. Anyway, the point is, is independent existence is meaningless. You have these relations that have to arise with the things, whatever, and there's this cause of closure. So this, this is this no thingness, right? This is why I put up that thing and I said, that's no thingness. Independent existence is meaningless. So no thingness is this idea that there's no thing somehow and I haven't figured out exactly philosophically how they do it but somehow there's a way to distinguish okay this is this is different from this computer okay so I've got this and I got this they're distinct things but they're they're not distinct in another way like there's a there's a level in which they're distinct and then there's a level in which they're not distinct right um, and I still sort of learning a little bit about that. So, we have a universe of no things and of and a universe of nothing. 
So you have two possibilities. So the universe itself is idempotent. So that's that funny word from math. Um, so there's a, du there's a duality here. The duality is that everything depends on nothing and nothing depends on everything. Because if the universe is idempotent, this whole idea, that, you, know, you go back to the, the concept of idempotency, you have you know, two solutions to that equation. You don't have one solution, you have two. And you can't ignore, you can't ignore <coughs> one in favor of the other. They, it, you could think of it this way, or I think of it this way, existence, because I'm a relationalist, existence is a concept that has to be defined in relation to something else, and that would be non-existence, nothingness. So you have to have that sort of duality, dependent origination of these two ideas in order for, for this to make any sense. So existence and nothingness have to arise together because they're defined in terms of one another in a, in a way. So that's a, a oneness rather than finite. Yes, this is a oneness. Yeah, yeah. So the no-thingness is a oneness. OK. Now, the question is, is, all right, so x is 1 or 0. The universe is idempotent. Okay, here's old Socrates. But x is what? And I, I don't remember. Somebody used this Socrates thing today in their talk. Was it you? Who, was, who used the Socrates quote today? Somebody did. Uh, I know one thing, and that is I know nothing. Um, maybe it was Ken. Was it Ken? Ken used it. Okay. So I know one thing, and that is I know nothing. Um, actually, I disagree with Socrates on this. I, and I, I hate to say it, I agree with this guy. I know one thing, and that is I exist. So it, in fact, I don't know nothing. I know that I exist. I stand by this. Our own existence is the one holy, indisputable fact that we have about the world. I tell my students, I could be dreaming. This could be, I, I, I could really be a Mongolian goat herder which actually sounds really good sometimes. Um, you know, there is no way that I can prove either to myself or to you that, that, that it's not a dream, that you're not philosophical zombies. I can't, I can't prove that. I have to just take it for granted. Like, I, you know, I can put it, I'm also a little bit of a Bayesian, so, right, I could say, uh, I, could, I could say, yeah, all right, sure, I, uh, you don't exist. But then if I went over and I, you know, slit your throat, <laughs> thinking, oh, he's not, he's not real, you know, I, I wouldn't want to bet on the fact that you're not real, right? Because then cops are going to come and it would be get, a, get ugly and, you know. Um, and and, and it's, this is an interesting question, too, because I, my best friend is paranoid schizophrenic and um, uh, has struggled with it. And it's, it's interesting because he, he does think sometimes that people are not real. But anyway, our own existence is the one wholly indisputable fact we have about the world. I, I'm, I'm, I know I exist. I'm here. I'm having an experience. You know, I may be dreaming. I, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't even know. I may not even know who I am, but I know that something's happening. I'm having an experience. So I think Descartes may be may have been a little correct. Um, Oh yes, and now that's an interesting question because the some animals, right, know that they exist. But what's really interesting is when you get to the point when you know that you know that you exist. And I argue that that's when sort of higher functioning comes into play in neuroscience and stuff like that. But that's a totally different argument. Um, so here's this wonderful quote again. Even a solipsist agrees there's at least one thing themselves, right? That's what a solipsist. That's what a solipsist thinks. Um, I, I know there are lots of criticisms of solipsism. I, I don't want to suggest this. I, I don't think this is solipsistic. I really don't. Um, but we'll get to that. The question is: Is what is that one thing? Okay. At least a solipsist. Even a solipsist agrees there's at least one thing. What is that one thing? I suggest that that one thing is conscious experience. I just said it. What am I sure of? I'm sure that I exist. Why am I sure that I exist? Because I'm experiencing something. 
my senses are taking in stuff. Whether I'm dreaming or not, I, I'm having an experience. So X is my conscious experience. That's what existence is, okay? Okay, what's that? What's conscious experience? Okay, so this is where um, I'm gonna bring up uh, a, I do some work in, even though I'm a physicist, quantum physicist, I do some work in, in consciousness, formal models of consciousness, in particular integrated information theory. And integrated information theory, which again, I'm not trying to sell, it's definitely got its warts. It's not a, you know, it's not a fully developed theory, even though it's been around a long time. Nevertheless, it's, it's got some interesting axioms that it poses as a formal model of consciousness. This is developed, it's got, there are hundreds of papers out there on it. It's been developed by, it's largely developed by a guy named Giulio Tononi. Um, it starts with axioms of what, so this is the latest version of IIT, which just came out like a month ago. The axioms of phenomenal existence. First is intrinsic existence, experience exists. There is something. Intrinsicality, which is not intrinsic existence, experience itself is intrinsic, it exists for itself. That's its only purpose. Experience is also specific. It is the way it is. My experience right here, right now, is the way it is. It is the way it is. I, I can do, you know, I could try changing it, but then by changing it, it's, that's the, it's still, that's part of the experience. It is the way it is. Why is that called information? I don't know, you'd have to ask Julio. Yeah, why, why do you know, I, I've never asked Julio that. I mean, they could, Julio came up with these things, these, uh, the, so the, the names of these things, he came up with these things 20 years ago. And it's almost like saying it has a form, and therefore it's like a, da a data and then it's information. Could be, I don't know. I will say one of the problems with IIT is that uh, a lot of it comes out of Julio Tononi's head, even though there are hundreds of people working on it, and, um, and Julio's head is a black box. So um, anyway. <laughs> The fourth one is integration. Experience is unitary. It is whole and irreducible. Meaning if I'm having an experience, I, and this is an interesting thing from the consciousness standpoint, right? If I'm having an experience, I cannot, it, it's, I'm not having two experiences, right? Um, there may be mental illnesses that where people seem to have multiple experiences simultaneously, but, but most of the time, no, I'm not aware of any, right? I'm having this experience. I'm not having another experience simultaneously where I'm at a football game or something, right? It's, it's whole and it's irreducible. Experience is also definite. It is this whole. It's not some other whole, it's this whole, okay? If you're, uh, um, you, the IIT then moves to axioms of physical existence by just as, essentially adding cause effect power to it, okay? If you're really interested, you can go look it up. You can ask me for the things. There's a quantum version that I helped develop that just came out um, uh, a week ago. All right. There's some tension between the thought that uh, experience is intrinsic with the prior thought that everything is relational. Yes, and I'm, I have an answer for that. I'm getting that. So let's just look at these two. Intrinsic existence. There is something, and it is this whole. X is something, thus it's not something else. It's this whole, it's not that whole, okay? So this ties into Eddington's structuralism. X is idempotent, it either exists or it doesn't. The experience either exists or it doesn't. X, remember, X is conscious experience now. I'm taking X to be conscious experience. X has cause effect power. Over or with respect to what, though? Other experience. Okay, so, and this is sort of the aspect of IIT. The, an experience, for something to be a conscious experience, it has to have causal power over other conscious experiences. So, my conscious experience here and I realize that there are some philosophical issues with that concept. That we've discussed them in, ad infinitum, and there, there have to be solutions to this, but anyway. Um, 
you know, I, I can, this experience that I'm having for it to be, a, you know, an actual experience has to have some kind of cause effect power over some other experience, which has to be a, uh, you know, there's got to be a relation between them. Now, of course, the question is, is dependent origination, how does that, how do you deal with time in relation to that and the, the creation of new experiences? That's a good question. I don't have an answer yet. But experience is relational. Now, here's the answer. I think it was your question. Objective reality arises from the relations. That's not just me saying it. There's this guy, Marcus Mueller, who a few years ago wrote a really great paper. He used algorithmic information theory to essentially show that you can get an objective external reality from a set of subjective observer states. So it appears as to, uh, this is a quote from his paper, it appears to observers as if there was an external world that evolves according to simple computable probabilistic laws. So by objective reality, that's what I mean, okay? So you have subjective observer states we're, you know, my experience, you guys could all be philosophical zombies. I have no idea. I can't prove it one way or the other. Um, I could be a philosophical zombie to you. Who knows? But there's an external sort of world that somehow evolves out of this. And he has a, a, a sort of a fairly rigorous argument for it. And obviously, it's using algorithmic information theory, so it's very specific. But it's an interesting idea. And this, this um, you know, but we all sort of, most of us anyway, objectively agree that there have been a couple of flies flying around, there's one right over there, right? So there's this sort of objective thing. And in fact, I want to I wanna emphasize, I, and I said this earlier in, in the other day, and Dean said, oh, I'll disabuse you of that notion, this idea of objective reality. Um, I think it's really important and an, and an overlooked point that, that that we operate, whether we like it or not, we operate on the fact that there is an objective reality. We're all, in a sense, Bayesian, right? Um, there's an objective reality that we're getting hungry and it is 623, right? We're, that's objectively true. Every one of you is probably thinking, oh my god, would you just shut up now? <laughs> there's an objective reality. When you drive down the road, you you know, most of you, maybe some of you speed, but you know, especially like in Australia, you have speed cameras. Um, you know, and, and I, not in Australia, but I learned the hard way in Switzerland that, that you know, the speed cameras, they don't warn you and you just get a ticket in the mail. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's an ob uh, objective reality. I can just choose to not pay that ticket, which is fine. But, you know, we, you know, we, we agree on certain things. In fact, just to the point, this is even, even more fundamental. You understand in the sense of you understand the meanings of the words I'm saying. You all, I'm speaking in English, you all are listening to me and you all speak English. You may think that what I'm saying, you know, you may not understand what I'm trying to get at, but you understand the meaning of the words I'm saying, right? And we take that for granted. So there clearly is some kind of a objective reality going on here because you know even if you're all philosophical zombies, there's, there's this idea that there's a communication happening. And for any communication to happen, there has to be a relation and that relation has to be sort of objectively real. But that, that objective reality does sort of arise out of the relationship itself, right? So it's a, it, it, this external world is objective, but it arises from these subjective states, okay? And it, there's this, this, this dependent origination idea behind this, right? That the, going back to Eddington, the, the relationalism is so fundamental to any existence, right? It doesn't make any sense without that kind of relation. So objective reality can arise from a set of subjective observer states. So, there is a universe of no things or of nothing. The set of all experiences and relations, the lack of any experiences, 
nothingness is this. No experiences whatsoever. Obviously, we're not here. No thingness is the set of all experiences. We're all having all of these experiences all simultaneously uh, right now, right? Obviously, so again, this is very fundamental, basic idea. I haven't thought about time in relation to this. I am a firm believer in an, an objective arrow of time. I do not believe in the block universe, which is, you know, if you're a general relativity guy, you believe, a lot of them believe in the block universe, which means time is just another dimension, and where we are in the universe, in time, is just a, the, the, the idea that there's an arrow of time is just a figment of our, um, it's, it's a, it's a, like a point of view. It, it's just because we just happen to be in a particular place in the block. Um, and of course, you know, that's great. That doesn't, that doesn't mean I can stop taking my cholesterol medicine and I'm gonna get younger <laughs> tomorrow. Um, so I, I, I fundamentally think there is an, an arrow of time and I have some ideas about what that is. I don't know how that fits in with this yet. But in any case, there it is. Because I do think that experience, so the, the discussion earlier of this idea of how long is now and how long does it take to have an experience, those are some deeply found fundamental questions that I don't think have been answered yet, but I think that would sort of help with some of this. But that's the basic idea. So no thingness, the whole idea here is that no thingness is meaningless without nothingness, okay? They're meaningless because the universe is idempotent. It produces a, a one and a zero. In the, at least in the sense of meaning. I, I'm not suggesting that there is some universe out there that, that, uh, where there's a lack of any experience, that there's sort of this parallel universe of nothing. Maybe there is, but what I'm saying is at least from, from a conceptual standpoint, from the concept of meaning, which is very important, they're meaningless without one another. No thingness is meaningless without nothingness, which is meaningless without no thingness, and so on all the way down. So I'm going to close with uh, a quote from um, Geshe Lakdor, who uh, is one of the monks that I've worked with. Um, and in 2015, he was at this, this <coughs> one, of, one of these sessions through this program. And he said, uh, people who have no knowledge of mathematics might think zero has no value. But for those, of, those who know mathematics, zero has a lot of value. Right? Nothingness depends on no thingness, which depends on nothingness. The Jurugura, which is thank you in the Dumbin language. I've got a quick, a quick comment, uh, question actually. So I think what you were talking about when you're saying objective reality, it looks like it was a convention. You're talking about we use it as a convention. It doesn't mean there's really an objective reality. It's a really useful convention that we all imagine that we're walking around in the same world having the same experiences. But that's something that needs to be sort of. Uh, Argued for. Yeah, so I would say I would say this. I'm I'm going to fall back on my Bayesianism. Um, yeah, absolutely. There, objective, re true objective reality may not exist. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't prove that any more than I could prove that it does exist. I'm going to bet. <laughs> I'm going to bet on the fact that there is an objective reality. I'm going to operate my life that there at least is this objective reality that arises from, because I find it interesting, by the way, in relation to that point, I found it interesting that Marcus changed the title of his paper. The early iteration of that paper, the paper is, the current title of the paper uh, says from uh, that physical states arise from subjective observer states. He originally had objective, the word objective in there, Someone clearly had, and that was in the original essay that he wrote, it was an FQXI essay. When he went to publish it, someone clearly said, you gotta take that word out. At least that's my, I haven't asked him. I should ask him about that. That's a good suggestion. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> anyway, so I, my point is, is that, yeah, I, again, I could be a Mongolian goat herder. I can't disprove that. I think it's a, is it a good, so it's, it's one thing to say it's a good convention, it's a good convention. You know, there are lots of good conventions. I think it's a little above a good convention. I think it's one that 
if we don't operate with that convention, like we, we instinctively operate on that good con that, that convention. We don't think about like when we go to dinner, you don't you you don't actually think, okay, I gotta put one foot in front of the other. You just instinctively go, right? Consciously, you just you just go. There are certain things you do instinctively that that we all rely on and we do. And I think that's sort of at a level, it's not just a convention, it's something because, and I'll tell you why. Here's, here's one of the reasons that I think, think of this, because I've looked, and this goes back to actually some stuff that, that Russell wrote and then some um, other people uh, had done. I've looked at some experiments that go back um, actually to, um, uh, um, what's his face, uh, uh, the dogs? Pavlov. Pavlov. So Pavlov is that actually wasn't Pavlov. It was one of his uh, one of the people in his lab whose name I can't remember. But she did this experiment with with they did a whole bunch of experiments with dogs. But the whole idea is that there are different species that seem to recognize certain things like number, right, and relations, and they, that seem to re sort of recognize some of that collective objective reality kind of thing that we generate, the convention, right? And I don't know what it is, but the point is, is that there's something that's not participating in this conscious discussion that we're having that seems to be exhibiting that same behavior and seems to operate on that same function. So I would say it's more than just a convention. If you know, I do have two questions. Um, Ruben, and then. Uh, it's, it's on the same point as well. I, I just feel that your your argument um, necessitates that it's not objective because you're saying by definition it's dependent on the dependent origination of these subjective states. So if you have a table with legs, if you take away the legs, the table collapses similarly with its objective reality. If you change the legs of the subjective observers or you remove them, it's the objective reality breaks down or changes, therefore it's not objective, mm -hmm. it's dependent. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it maybe is a, it, it, so okay, so depend, maybe a dependent reality is a better word than objective. I think it comes down to your definition of the word objective, which again comes down to the limitations of language. So and certainly if you take also the Tibetan Buddhist perspective, they say, okay, then that would also need to be empty, right? Otherwise you'd be yeah. positing that empty things give rise to something that is not itself empty, but it's, it yeah. is. Yeah, so, so Eddington actually, he had this, his sort of philosophy was uh, selective subjectivism, right? So he called it selective subjectivism, that this idea that, well, we're selectively subjective. So there are these, Again, is objective the right word? Um, I don't know. But uh, the reason I use objective is, be is because I do, again, I, here's the thing. In my other sort of line of work, right, I teach a class on climate change. And I, and I do it not just because it's, it's interesting, but, it, but it's because I, I truly believe we're all fucked. We are fucked. And that's objectively real to me. Like the fact that my that that you know while we were away, the end of my street flooded is objectively real. Luckily my house is okay. But you know, it flooded. That's objectively real. I need to somehow convince people who don't necessarily believe it that, that climate change is what? Objective re re be real. So I have to use like that's why I use the word objective, because those are the fundamental things that I think, if we don't get a handle on that, man, we are fucked. And I mean, we're probably already fucked, but. I also thought this was brilliant, your presentation. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> Is there freedom in your model, and what does it look like? Is there what? Freedom. freedom in oh, so that's a really good question. So I have an entire separate model of free will. Spiritual freedom. Spiritual oh, spiritual freedom. freedom. That's not such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have, a, I have a completely separate theory of free will that I published. No, no will. 
Oh, so freedom. So you're not talking about, so free, so what do you mean by freedom? Freedom, we want it all, all kinds of love. Oh, okay. Our ego, all sorts of flavors. Oh, it's logical. Yeah, so I am, I am most definitely not, so as a quantum mechanics guy, I am definitely not a, I do not believe the universe is um, deterministic. I don't believe it's term. I also don't believe it's entirely random. I think, it, I think it's somewhere in the middle. It's between randomness and deterministic. So yes, there absolutely is freedom. How does it play into this? I haven't figured that out yet. But yeah, there, I, I think there should be, because I firmly believe that there is some freedom and it ex you know, the universe is somewhere in between deterministic and random, right? Because quantum processes are very clearly random, like the most random things you can create, that's lotteries now use them. But then there's clearly deterministic things, you know? If I don't pay my taxes, the government's going to come looking for me. That's, you know, that's a, that's a deterministic thing. So the universe exists sort of somewhere in the middle there. And so yeah, there has to be this, this freedom of, of sense, but I think freedom, even beyond free will, the concept of freedom is somewhere in between those two things. It's not pure randomness, it's not deterministic, it's somewhere in the middle. But how that fits in with this, I don't know. Okay, we're gonna leave it there for today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you to Dean. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Dean. I was actually going to say, thanks to everyone for coming as well, because it was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I had high hopes, but not this high, so that's very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So what were you going to ask? In the land of the Gisvalda. Right, sorry. Yes, yes, no, so, yes, I think the reason I hedge my bets on that is because I'm a scientist and I say yes, but I can't prove it. Yes, yes, Not true that 